40. Predestination versus Human Rights Romans 9, 24 to 29. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he hath said also in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that, in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work, and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma, and been made like unto Gomorrah. Romans 9, 24-29 Paul's passionate concern is to shut the door on any and every attempt by man to assert his imagined privileges and rights against God. Man can make no claims on God, nor appeal to any independent realm of truth and justice against God. Man cannot manufacture his philosophical myths, such as free will, and assert them against God. The idea of free will rests on Genesis 3.5, man's claim to be his own God and determiner. Men do not create themselves, their context race, aptitudes nor heritage, they are products of a human history. Faced with God, however, men insist on a mythical freedom which rests on their will to be gods. In verse 24, Paul tells us that God has predestined and chosen, called his vessels of mercy from among both Jews and Gentiles. Both are in the church, They are evidences of God's grace to all peoples. Salvation is not a natural privilege or rights of any people. Sinners then have no rights before God, no claims of their own. We must add that no man, sinner or saint, covenant breaker or covenant keeper, has any rights or privileges before God. But. What of Israel? Paul sees Israel as the chosen covenant people of God, not as a bloodline. Hence, they are not all Israel which are of Israel, Romans 9, 6, and he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God, Romans 2, 29. Thus, Paul's point that some of the called are Jews is very important to his thesis. As John Murray noted, that there should be the called from Jewry belongs to the argument of the passage as a whole. The covenant promise has not failed, but comes to effects in the true Israel, the true children, the true seed. Compare verses 6 to 9, 27, 29. 11, 5 and 7. God's calling is both a discipline and a grace. We are prepared for our calling by those things God has us experienced beforehand and his prevenient grace schools us for his service. In verse 25, Paul quotes Hosea 2, 23, wherein God declares that the apostles of Israel shall be again made God's people. Paul cites a verse dealing with Israel's restoration to show the grace of God means also the ingathering of all peoples. Whether it be Israel or the Gentiles, it is all of grace. Membership in the covenant is by God's grace and calling, not by birthright or natural privileges. In verse 27, the same fact is developed further. This time he quotes Hosea 1.10. Wherever there are Gentiles in any part of the world, there in time 
These will be God's covenant people by God's electing grace. The use of Hosea is telling. All covenant breakers are compared to an adulterous woman who has turned prostitute. The sin of the unregenerate is as repulsive in God's sight and his grace totally unmerited. A hoarding wife can make no claims on her husband. She has no natural privilege or right. In fact, Leviticus 20.10 makes clear the death penalty applies to both the adulterer and the adulteress. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress, shall surely be put to death. Man's only merited status is death. In verse 27, Paul goes from the calling of the Gentiles to the exclusion of physical Israel. He does not say that the Jews are excluded, but rather that Israel and Judea as covenant peoples are excluded. Great numbers of Jews and Galileans, Israelites, were saved as individuals, but not the nation as such. However numerous Israel may be, only a remnant was saved. The church supplants Israel as the covenant people, and the nations as such no longer has any standing. Paul now cites Isaiah 10, 22 and 23, which refers to the reduction of the nation by the Assyrian invasion. Israel is to be reduced to a remnant, but must not fear, for God's purposes for the remnant shall triumph. The return is a covenantal return. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Isaiah 10, 21 Paul writes with the apostasy of Judea and the forthcoming fall of Jerusalem in mind. Hendrickson noted, At this point, we should guard ourselves against committing an error in our interpretation. It is a rather common practice to say that Paul now begins to spiritualize by stating that only the remnant will be saved. However, a close look at Isaiah's own prophecy shows that he by no means restricts his prophecy to a prediction of a physical return from captivity, but states that the remnant will return to the mighty God, Isaiah 10.21. They will lean on Jehovah, will rely on the Lord, verse 20. Paul is therefore exactly reproducing Isaiah's thought when he says that of the total number of Israelites, only the remnant will be saved. Paul makes clear that both the calling of the Gentiles and the rejection of Israel are predicted in the Old Testament. It is clearly implied that the Gentiles will be rejected if they assume that their status is a natural privilege. Romans 11, 19-21 Isaiah 1-9 is again cited by Paul in verse 29. Isaiah is emphatic that only God's grace separates Israel from Sodom and Gomorrah, and the same is implied with respect to the Gentiles. Personal merit, as a natural privilege and power, has no standing before God. In verse 28, the efficiency of God is stressed. God's purpose with respect to history is effectively carried through by him. This development is contrary to our will, but in terms of God's will. By citing Isaiah, Paul calls attention to Old Testament history as verification of his statement. God used judgment to separate the apostates from Israel and to salvage and bless in time his remnant. The same process is again at work. Sunday and Hedlam rendered verse 28 in these words. For a work, accomplishing and abridging it, that is, a sentence conclusive and concise, will the Lord do upon the earth. 
They cite these verses as a further development by Paul of the power and rights of God as creator as against man. Having said this, Sandy and Hedlam, like so many others, then proceed to undercut Paul's meaning by insisting that Paul was somehow substantiating man's independent will. Their conclusion, therefore, is designed to restore to man some degree of power in their determination. They recognize that Paul declares God's sovereignty and his freedom from man's being and actions, that is, the totally sovereign power of God in determining all things without reference to the creature's will as in any sense determinative. The freedom of the divine election and its gratuitous nature are then undercut. Paul, who has so insistently stressed God's sovereignty, begins to sound for Sande and Hedlam and others as well like a 19th century English liberal. Somehow, no matter what Paul says, he is made to sound like a reasonable man with a full appreciation of the moral values of man's independent will. This misinterprets Paul. Paul, as an intensely loyal Jew, was clearly aware of Israel's moral superiority among the nations. Given the Sadduceeism, the Phariseeism, and the judicial murder of Jesus Christ, Israel was still far ahead of all other nations. In morality, education and discipline, no other nation of antiquity could compare with Israel, and Israel knew it. As a consequence, Israel saw itself as superior and as naturally privileged among the nations. The Jews were everywhere a proud and a successful people, and our Lord indicts this pride which is carried into the very presence of God in prayer. Luke 18, 10-14 This attitude clashed with the pride, arrogance, an assured sense of superiority which marked Greeks and Romans. Paul indicted this in Jews and Gentiles with unsparing words. For who maketh thee to differ from another, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? 1 Corinthians 4, 7 It is a human feeling which we are all prone to manifest, that is, to compare various nationalities favourably or unfavourably and to assess their differences. Paul has no use for this, declaring, For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 22-23 Paul hates natural privilege and natural rights, because he sees it as the deadly moral ailment of his own people whom he loves intensely. He sees it as a threat to the future of the church. Romans 11, 19-21 For the Gentile believers to view Israel's pride and its sense of natural privilege with smug disdain is for Paul to manifest the same deadly evil Our standing before God and in history is a matter of sovereign grace, mercy and predestinating purpose. We may have virtues and abilities by the grace and providence of God, but God also raises up his Assyrias, Babylons, Romes and Soviet unions to do his work and to shake the nations. To rest on natural privileges, powers and rights is to rest on death, for all such are sure to perish. Where men insist on their natural privileges, powers and rights before God, they will soon feel free to go their own way without God. They are confident in their own power and ability. The language of law will then shift from God's law to human rights, and justice begins to fade. The term human rights has no definition. It means what the speaker chooses to make it mean. 
it means in our time a variety of things. That is, Marxism declares itself to be the gospel of human rights, homosexuality, abortion, child molestation, the sexual revolution, drugs and more are all defended in terms of human rights. Men in the state define human rights and it can mean anything. In First Amendment cases, it often means the suppression of Christianity. The premises of all such thinking are destroyed by Paul. God is the Lord. Man has no claims against him. Isaiah, faced with the vision of the glory of God, saw that, instead of any privilege, he merited only judgment. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah 6, 5 A note about the reference to the Lord of Sabaoth in verse 29. It is translated in the Old Testament from Yahweh Sabaoth as the Lord of hosts or armies. He is the Lord who controls all armies so that nothing moves apart from him. By using this term, Paul stresses further the fact of predestination. 